There we go. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, my name is Rick Ellis. I'm the executive director of AWBD, and I'm here to welcome you to AWBD's third of a series, uh, our new series of industry webinars. So please note, we're a couple housekeeping items. We're keeping attendance for these webinars. So if there are some of you who might be watching the webinar together at your district office or somewhere else, please shoot Sarah an email, let her know that you are watching and give her your name and we need to know whose account you're watching it from. Speaking of attendance, we have an outstanding 252 people registered for today's webinar. That is the highest number we've had for any of our industry, actually any of our webinars, parks and industry. So thank you for joining us today. If there's anyone new on the webinar today and you would like to get notifications about the industry webinar, please email Sarah Albright. And if you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A tab. So for today's webinar, we have a panel of speakers who will be talking to us about leveraging regulatory changes to improve reliability through a utility scale microgrid. Pretty appropriate right now. Uh, our speakers today are John Elder with Acclaim Energy, Harry Masterson with Ember Real Estate Investment and Development, and Thomas Wells with Southern Power and Power Secure. So I'm going to give them brief introductions and then we'll jump right in. So here come the introductions. John D. Elder III, Acclaim Energy. John is joining us today from the lovely island of Capri, Italy. Welcome, John. John has been the key force behind Acclaim Energy for over 20 years transforming it into a successful company with a range of services in various industries and markets. He started in the energy field, focused primarily on the mud industry, and today his company has grown into a leading advisory firm built on continuous innovation in procurement, risk management, microgrids, and sustainability. Today, Acclaim Energy is positioned as a trusted advisor across the U.S. and Mexico. John's leadership continues to make Acclaim Energy a leader in energy innovation and excellence. Next, we have Harry Masterson with Ember Real Estate Investment and Development. We have dubbed Harry today the Dapper Developer. If you notice, he's better dressed than all of us. Uh, a native Houstonian, Harry Masterson is an industry leader with deep roots in the Houston area. His proven track record spans over nearly three decades in the real estate industry, primarily focusing on large land transactions and quality planned developments. Uh, experienced in bringing the right stakeholders to the table and pioneering innovative development concepts, Harry's role as managing principal at Ember allows him to primarily focus on new business opportunities and industry relationships. And finally, from the great city of Birmingham, Alabama, we have Thomas Wells with Southern Power and Power Secure. Thomas Wells is the federal and state policy manager for Southern Power and Power Secure and is responsible for leading federal, state, and local external affair activities. Wells' activities include assessing federal policy and leading advocacy efforts with US, U.S. legislative and executive branch bodies while coordinating with Southern Company's Washington, D.C. office, assessing state policy, and advocating positions with key members of state government, and ensuring integration of company assets in local communities and maintaining compliance with local obligations. So we are going to get started. I also want to say a special thank you to Dennis, Dennis Vegas with uh, Acclaim. He's helping make this whole thing happen. So I'm going to run the show. We are going to start with John and let me advance the slides and we will get going. There we go. So there was, there was our agenda, uh, made the comments, introduced the speakers. John is going to talk about the uh, journey of the utility scrape micro scale microgrid. Uh, Harry is going to give us the developer perspective. And then uh, Thomas is going to talk about legislative regulatory landscape. So let us get started with John. There we go. That's his bio. Fantastic. That's Harry. Might roll, yeah, roll through there the bio. There we go. We ready, John? Well, I am ready. I am ready. And the fact that you're in control, Rick. It's kind of a scary concept, but thank me. you very, very. Okay, is, is that as I was watching everyone sign up, there are a lot of new names and faces, okay, um, that I have not been visited with, that this is going to be the first time uh, that y'all have heard what's going on out there with regards to this, what's become known as the utility scale microgrid. So we're looking forward to telling you about it. 
So the ones that many of you actually I've talked to. So I'm going to re recover a couple of bases just to kind of make sure that everybody knows what's happening and bring everybody up to the same level. So as a brief history, basically three years ago is, is that um, after the ice storm that we had that, that damaged so much of everyone's lives, it created an awareness for me that we had a problem with regards to reliability at those sewer treatment and water treatment plants within the MUDs, okay? And what I embarked upon was a journey to try to improve both the water, the reliability at the water plants and the sewer treatment plants with the concept of saying, how can we also protect the neighborhood, okay? All the homes in the neighborhood, all the businesses in the neighborhood, the grocery stores, the gas stations, okay? So three years ago, it seemed a little bit like a pipe dream, quite frankly, but we started working on it and we established something called the Texas Reliability Coalition of which um, quite a few of the MUDs joined and um, in some local cities, with the concept of how could we work with the PUC, the Public Utility Commission, and our local utilities to actually create a way to be able to have both reliability for our water plants and then also reliability for our entire mud and all the homes in, in it, okay? So we started the conversation three years ago. Uh, I thought that it was gonna take a year to do this. It's taken three. OK, to make it happen. But now what we have is, is that we are um, we're looking at the opportunity to make this real in very short order. So don't volunteer to do something in the government sector unless you've got lots of patients. But it's actually here. So here's where we are today is is that we have been working with Centerpoint for three years to work out a lot of the details and to get them comfortable with this whole concept. And we'll explain what the concept is here in just a second, okay? But so there's been a lot of work done to just kind of get everybody up to speed and to figure out what we were doing and how it is that we wanted to do it. So think of it as we've been working with them, doing pilots, having discussions, having meetings, and now what's happened is, is that Centerpoint is comfortable with everything. So they have put on, on offer at the Public Utility Commission um, to do the pilots, okay? The first example of this. And what you're gonna learn today is, is that with Centerpoint's flexibility and their, their willingness to look at things a little different, that they have created a solution that allows us to bring reliability to your entire neighborhood as opposed to just the water and sewer plants, okay? So here's what's going, here's what's actually happening, is, is that we are installing larger generators, okay, inside the mud that puts power back into the distribution grid, okay? Is, is that, and what we're trying to do is use the dollars that we're gonna spend on reliability, okay, use them smarter, and get it to where it pays for itself, okay? So what we're trying to do is, is that, and what we've done is be able to cost effectively use a lot of the existing infrastructure in the neighborhood, okay, to be able to get power to the homes if the grid does actually fail, okay? Is, is that in these same generators, if the grid is working, okay, actually provide support for the grid so that when we get in those periods during the summer when there's um, extreme demand, okay, is, is that we're actually putting power back on the grid during those periods to keep the grid from failing, okay? So the, um, the, what we're doing is, is that we're solving the issue for the MUDs around keeping water pressure up in all of your homes and at the same time is, is that we're solving the desire that everybody has to keep the power on at all times so that everybody's not having to go out and put backup power back behind their house, okay? So the goal here is, is to have a, um, a system that helps the grid to stay balanced normally, okay? But in the event that we do have a failure, okay, of the power grid is, is that your homes will all be um, kept uh, um, electrified and keep your lights on as well as the businesses and the schools in the neighborhood, okay? 
So Rick, you want to switch the um, switch the slides? Okay. So this was this is a picture, okay, of what it is that we're talking about. So what is happening is is that your mud actually is connected to the rest of the grid at multiple places, right? Each mud is actually different. We're learning a lot about how things were designed, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago when we've been doing this. But the bottom line is, is that your mud connects to the outside grid at various points. And what CenterPoint is doing is, is that they are putting devices wherever our mud connects with the outside world. And the devices are set up to where they can turn on or off. So we have the ability that if the grid goes down, we can create an island of just your mud and the generators that we have inside of the mud will keep everything lit, okay? So this is called a, um, a utility scale microgrid, okay? It's part of something they call the smart grid was where the original, some of the ideas came from. But the bottom line is, is that with CenterPoint working hand in hand with us, this is not only doable, okay, but it can be made very real and, um, and we can do it very quickly, okay? Rick, next, next slide. Okay. All right, so the question becomes, why is this important to the MUDs and how in the world can this actually work, all right? Is, is that, so the first thing that's happening is, is that we're looking at each MUD, okay, as a unique entity, we're create, we're calling it a lighthouse for all the customers, all right? So you'll have distinct MUDs, okay, that are by the, with the legal boundaries that are gonna be the microgrid, right? Is, is that what we're doing is, is that we're supporting the critical facilities within the MUDs as well as the houses. So by taking care of all the water facilities and doing it the way that we're doing it, there's just a lot of additional benefits, okay? Is, is that um, the in the way that uh, Texas is set up is, is that if the grid gets in trouble, is, is that they're gonna institute rolling blackouts. This will avoid our MUDs from having to go through that, okay? So what's going to happen is, is that the utility will actually turn on the microgrid and you will not have to go through the rolling blackouts, which is part of the insurance policy that Texas has if we get into trouble, okay? Is, is that then by having the center points thinking on this is by having these microgrids out there is, is that they can focus on other areas to fix, okay? So they're using limited resources. They're leveraging their resources more intelligently, which is what they need to be doing from a service standpoint, okay? And this solution, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys have been reading lately, but, um, but what CenterPoint has done is they went ahead and leased a bunch of mobile generation, okay, for emergencies. Is, is that, um, and it, it in some instances it's worked, but what this does is, is that this is a much more cost-effective way of providing that service, rather than having a bunch of leased mobile generators running around in the center point service territory. So it's just think of this as the next generation of better, more efficient and effective ways to keep the lights on, okay? Is, is that, um, and these microgrids that we're gonna be talking about, Okay, are actually already performing in different areas of the country, in different areas in Texas. Some of them are designed a little bit different, but none of this is new science. Okay, these are things that have been done elsewhere, but nobody's ever done them the way that we want to do them here around Houston because of our unique set of circumstances. Now, the big thing, okay, that I, I know is going to be resonating with the um, with the participants on the webinar is. How do we pay for this? Okay, this all sounds great that we can have reliability, we can have resiliency, we can take care of the water problem, we never have to put generators behind our homes, but who's paying for this? Okay, the reality of it is this, Texas, the problem that we have here in Texas is so large, okay, that these costs are going to be spread across all the rate payers. So there is not going to be any direct additional costs to the MUDs to have this service. 
And the reason for this is, is that yes, as a MUD, you're in a unique position where we are going to get reliability in the event that we have big grid problems because we've got this. But by us having this, it's providing a social good for the rest of the grid to keep it from failing. Okay, so the logic behind this is, is that this needs to be a cost that's shared amongst all the ratepayers in their electrical bill. And that's what's going to pay for this for everyone. Okay, so I've got two other people here that have got some exciting things to share. So I'm not going to take any more of the time. So, Harry, can you share with us as a developer how it is that you're seeing this as you've been involved with it for quite a few years if we worked it up? Uh, I'm happy to, and uh, thank you for having me here uh, this morning. I, I will say that uh, I, that might have been my first question is, uh, how much is it going to cost me? And I was delighted to know that, no, uh, I, I wasn't fronting the money for, uh, for a utility scale microgrid. Uh, I think it's fair to say that most residential developers do not understand what a, a utility scale microgrid is. We've heard the word microgrid, <clears throat> especially those of us that also do industrial development, a microgrid is sort of a smaller island. Uh, and and um, I've been uh, fortunate enough to have uh, uh, John walk me uh, through the complexities of this. Um, as a I am a developer. I'm also uh, a mud board president. I've served on that uh, mud board for 15 years. And so we, I've, I've seen the regulations in this state uh, increase and our responsibilities increase. And uh, of course, one of the most important things as a mud that we do is supply reliable water and sanitary service, sewer service, and uh, of course, it's, it's no longer an option for it to, you know, for it to be reliable. It's actually, you know, a costly uh, requirement. And uh, and so what most of us are facing are, are generators that cost several hundred thousand dollars and, uh, and they need to be maintained. And it's just a, another layer of uh, operating costs that, that, that we're having to deal with. Um, I'd say as, as a developer, uh, like any other, like any sort of business perspective, it, it it's hard to justify an investment of time, money, or even real estate when it's difficult to measure what the benefit is uh, uh, or or the outcome. I mean, what are, what are we going to get for our investment, and so forth, going in? Uh, and as this evolved, and and John explained this to me, uh, it it came came pretty clear. I mean, I, I really look at it as sort of two kinds of benefits, what I would call a direct and measurable benefit and an indirect and sort of an unmeasurable benefit uh, for the development. Uh, for the residents, there are direct benefits. So they are, as we discussed, largely immune from the rolling blackouts and, and, and rolling blackouts are, are not what I would consider something associated with a catastrophic event like we've, like we've had in the last week or even previous to that with this derecho or tornado, whatever whatever blew through town, tearing all the, uh, the trees out of the ground. Um, but um, that is really more of the demands and the balances that these guys are working on, making sure that, that we, we, you know, we're not told to, uh, that we can't keep our thermostat set where we want it to be. Um, additionally, uh, what we're looking at is a, is a better protection and a quicker restoration of power in a catastrophic storm event. So unlike much of Houston, where we've got power lines going down the rear easements of all the lots and, and you know, somebody's tree falls and the whole, you're, you know, all the neighbors are without power. Most of what we do in new developments, uh, the power is buried. There, there is power above ground. Uh, but it's usually on the edges, it, it, and uh, we try to keep it out of sight. And so in the event of a catastrophic event, what this means is that our island, our, our microgrid, our, our community, which for me is, a, is ultimately going to be about 6,000 homes, uh, uh, should be able to have 
power restored at a much quicker rate because uh, we just don't have the, all the old infrastructure that, that most of Houston has. And, uh, and I think it's pretty important that we're, we're, we're talking about eliminating the reliance on home backup generators, which are sort of like a pool. I mean, you can't just put it in and not worry about it. Somebody's got to maintain it. And, uh, uh, you know, running it for a couple of hours is one thing, but trying to run it for a week or so gets complicated. And uh, so we're very excited about not uh, uh, not having residents rely upon their their own backup generators. In addition, I think there are uh, some important indirect benefits for our, our residents. So the the overall grid resiliency uh, is improved beyond beyond the neighborhood, beyond the community, and uh, and that that really goes to quality of life and lifestyle. You know, you leave the neighborhood and, 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 you know, you want things operational out there. And, and probably the biggest picture, and Texas does, as we know, we do have power problems. Uh, and it will be increasingly so as industry is headed here. And if we can't address the problems, we're not getting the major manufacturers, these huge capital investments, these large employers that are looking to Texas. And... From a developer perspective, or a home builder perspective, or you know, just general economic perspective, it's good for Houston. It's good for all of us uh, to have that growth come to Houston. So that 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 is something that, that benefits us all, even though it is somewhat indirect. Uh, can we let's advance to the next slide? All right. So. Um, Again, the MUDs are in a unique position. We, you know, we we daily we're dealing with being uh, in the position of providing utilities uh, for for the residents within the MUD, and we're really quite a unique entity. We're is we're our status as a quasi governmental entity uh, allows us um, to to enter into agreements. Uh, uh, that, that really um, don't have a timeline. I mean, we exist in perpetuity uh, and, and um, that, that allows us to, to work with major, uh, you know, like the center point in this case, to be able to know that we can work out an agreement with them that, that um, you know, it, it isn't like somebody's just gonna uh, leave next week. Like the developer will develop and be gone. The muds are there forever, and um, and and that provides long-term stability there. Um, I think that uh, um, the, you know I see the benefits both as as on the mud side and the developer by eliminating these costs uh, of, of having these single-site backup generators, which uh, you know, uh, just seems to be a, a bigger and bigger part of what we're dealing with in my mud meetings. Uh, it allows us to deliver uh, a higher degree of reliability for our water and wastewater, and uh, and and this this backup, uh, the backup power provides reliability for our systems throughout the mud. So it's not just the water and the wastewater plant, but our lift stations. Uh, uh, businesses which are inside of our mud, um, the, you know, the schools, the emergency services, just all these little things that you just become accustomed to, to having. You know, uh, how many of us are dealing with flashing red lights at, at the intersection? Still, still, we can't get around town uh, dealing with that. And um, and allows us to, to solve some, some bigger questions, stabilization of the Texas grid, which is huge. And and we're dealing, you know, ha having Centerpoint involved means that we are working with a company that has, I believe the number is 24% of the Texas grid. So this is, this is something that is, is uh, it will be successful and it's scalable. It goes well beyond our borders and, uh, and the MUDs are really uniquely positioned to, to be part of this group in this venture uh, uh, for, for, something that goes way, way out into the future.
And I, I think that's it for me. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Thomas Wells and, and uh, let him, the guy that really understands what's going on. <laughs> No, no, Harry, it, it, it certainly takes a team. Um, I, I do want to just pause for a second prior to just jumping into kind of this policy landscape, because I I see some some questions have some important questions have been dropped in the chat. And um, John or Harry and, and Rick as well, do we want to address those? Because they, they're kind of deal with the structure as opposed to the policy in we could address those now or, or hold them to the end. If they fit into your conversation, certainly. But if you want to wait till the end, I'm, I'm keeping track of them. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Well, I'll, I'll just say as a, as a little bit of an intro um, from Power Secure standpoint. So Power Secure is a leading provider of microgrids across, across the U.S. So we have about 2,600 customer sites um, across the U.S. And um, have a good footprint also in, in Texas, so about 200 customer sites with 70 plus of those actually in, in the Houston area. Um, and do just want to point out, because there was one question about the duration um, of these assets being being utilized during an outage. And so just some stats from, from Barrel, um, 70 plus assets in the, the greater Houston area um, we were operating across a lot of events. You can imagine an average duration of event of a run was 32 hours across those 70 plus assets um, with the longest one being seven and a half days. And so I think that just maybe some context for um, the operation of, of um, our units. Obviously those are units that, that are more um, focus on individual customers as opposed to the concept that that John and, and Harry um, have laid out. Um, so hopefully that answers maybe a little bit one of, one of those questions. And so let me let me now dive into this this policy space because John and Harry did a great job of you know teeing up the structure. And I just want to reiterate, you know, the timing is right right now. Um, to really push out this, this solution that John and Harry described. There's been a lot um, that has been developed from a policy perspective and a lot that continues to be developed from a policy uh, perspective that really is um, encouraging um, the, the deployment of microgrids generally, but specifically this utility scale microgrid and specifically the application um, to a, a mud environment and its associated water system. Um, so kind of, you know, what is what is that current landscape or what happened to create this, this positive environment? I think it's probably these three main bills. And so, you know, right after URI, um, the legislature in Texas passed Senate Bill 3. And so that really established, and John alluded to this, but it established the requirements for providers of water service to really have a, an emergency preparedness plan. And, and in that bill, they specifically pointed out that on-site generation um, can be utilized as a solution um, in that plan to ensure that um, we maintain water, water supply. You know, fast forward to, to 2023, the legislature was still thinking about how can we continue to improve reliability, resiliency of, of the electric sector. And here they they pushed out House Bill 2555. And this really provides kind of a mechanism or a vehicle for utilities like Centerpoint to um, go to the commission and submit a resiliency plan so that has resiliency measures um, in it and ask for cost recovery um, of those measures. So really, this was historic, first of a kind um, opportunity um, that was presented in Texas. And then the third bill also in, in 2023 was House Bill 1500. And this was really important. This 
it modified and expanded kind of the use cases or the periods in which utilities like CenterPoint can lease and operate emergency generation. And so now utilities can, can lease this emergency generation like from a microgrid that we're describing today and, and use that to ensure you know, public health, public safety, that critical infrastructure is remains on. And importantly, it clearly states that, you know, water and wastewater facilities are critical infrastructure that needs to be maintained. So it opens the door for utilities um, to, to lease this, this generation. So all of this really has led us to CenterPoint formally filing a resiliency plan um, this past April with the commission. And so it, it's a big plan, you know, 900 plus pages, $2 billion, has a lot of resiliency measures. But, you know, important for this discussion, it has a measure that is the utility scale microgrid pilot program. So about 36 and a half million is what the ask is from CenterPoint to, to initiate this program and get some pilots moving. So I'll say we're, we're very excited about, about this provision, about this opportunity. John, Harry, myself, we've been talking to, you know, a lot of stakeholders advocating um, for this, this program. Um, and, we, you know, we're at the commission as well, um, advocating um, for it and, are excited to, to see the commission um, eventually approve and, and get this program implemented. So that's a little bit of the landscape. I'll, I'll pause there and Rick, I'll turn it back over to you and we can see if there's any questions. Yeah, there are. And that was a great segue, Thomas, because this last question that just came in is which legislators are pushing these bills, SP3, HR 2555 and HR 15, through Congress, uh, one or more senators and congressmen authored or are and are favoring our bill. So you mentioned you're working with some stakeholders. Are you guys working with the, the legislators? Yes, we are. We're talking to you know a lot of offices, and I'll just say, say those three bills. Um, you know, there was a lot of support for those three br bills, broad support, and I would I would almost venture to say you know unanimous, almost unanimous support. And so I think there is, um, there's a recognition um, across all offices in, in Austin that reliability and resiliency of the grid of critical infrastructure um, is needed and needs to be improved. And we are, you know, have been educating them on the role that microgrids can play in that. And definitely seeing some um, a better understanding of of this concept because um, it does provide a lot of value you know reliability resiliency but also physical security um you know among among other things okay long question is the utility scale microgrid technology current being currently being used anywhere else and if so when will it be available to the Fort Bend area also, what will be the increase of cost to consumers when we go to this technology? Okay, let me let me grab that. Is is that on the first side of it is is that the microgrid concept? Okay, generally speaking, is um, is present in lots of markets around the country. Okay, what is different here is not the technology that we're using, but the application. Okay, we're putting the microgrid in the middle of the distribution grid. Okay, and we're using the the um, boundaries of a mud to determine its size and how it works. Okay, so think of it as the technology that we're using that's being used is already proven. Okay, there's nothing new with regards to it. It's how it's being used. Okay and the fact that it's becoming a part of the way that the grid is managed. So historically, is, is that these were not a part of the man management of the grid, right? 
So in the fort, the other the other part of the question was, is it about Fort Ben? Okay, is is that what's going to happen? Is is that the initial pilots that are being uh, uh, walk through the PUC right now that we're looking for approval? Okay, are not for a specific area. They're just for the center point service territory. Okay, so once this starts going, center point will be determining which areas that they want these put in first. Okay, and which muds that they want them in first. But it will, it's based on other things other than counties. So think of it as once the door gets open. Okay, once all the approvals get made is is that then it's going to be the center point service territory in total is where they're going to go. And uh, at least uh, at first, and we're expecting other utilities across the state to adopt this once they can see how it works. And uh, they're letting center point kind of pave the road as it stands right at this moment. John, I would just just to add one thing to that, and, and you alluded to it. Other utilities have a similar opportunity to do what Centerpoint is doing here. Um, and so I think once Centerpoint, as you as you said, kind of proves proves the concept, gets gets things on the ground, operating, running, I think we will see um, other utilities recognizing that that benefit and filing similar um, programs with with the commission. Yeah. Great, great segue into the next question. It says you mentioned Centerpoint. Do you all know if Entergy is also planning to set up utility scale microgrids? Okay, Entergy has a couple of different types of programs, okay? None of which are kind of have this exact view on them. Our suspicion is, is that once um, Entergy and the other TDSPs see how this works, it's probably gonna be something that's gonna make good sense, okay? Their grid has the same problems, okay? But they're a regulated utility, all right? So they have a different set of uh, requirements and a different set of rules that they operate under. So I would say that they will ultimately, once they see how this works, Physically, they're probably going to want to uh, copy it. Um, and then it's just got to figure out how it can work in the uh, regulated marketplace. Good. Good. What is the likely performance of these utility scale microgrids during an event like we had with Barrel? Uh, any reference points you could share? Yeah. Let me jump in there and... John and Harry can can add to so, yep. So, just had a definitely an extreme extreme weather event, and like I said, we have Power Secure has about seventy plus um, microgrid assets in in the Greater Houston area, and over the course over the duration of of Barrel, uh, we operated approximately ninety seven percent reliability across across those seventy plus assets. Okay, so a related and question. Also, I love Rick, just, oh, go just ahead, John. FYI, Rick, they actually, Centerpoint actually brought some of these assets in from, I believe it was Dallas that Power Secure had to help with the, um, with putting putting Houston back together here for the last three weeks. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's pretty much, it's a well-run track with regards to the equipment that we're using, as well as sort of the, the technology behind it. So related and timely, do microgrids work when trees fall on power lines? <laughs> now, <laughs> well, here's what's happening. We are using the existing infrastructure, okay, to enable this. So what's really happening is all the lines and poles, whether they be buried, okay, or up in the air, is what we're using to create the microgrid. If we have damage, okay, to that infrastructure, it has to be fixed before the microgrid can be activated. Okay, so we can't. Um, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's one piece of the puzzle that if we're using the above ground infrastructure to do the microgrid, it is subject to a tree. Okay, and we just can't really do anything about that other than trying to be as proactive as we can around how you're maintaining your trees. 
So what is for you all, what is the driving force? What is driving you to be front and center in this initiative? Um, well, uh, if, you know, I'll, I'll take that uh, uh, since it's not technical. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, to me, there there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, uh, reasons that this is appealing to me. Um, you know, John and I've been talking about this for uh, a, a couple of years, uh, and um, so I, maybe he's playing on the fact that I'm impatient. But you know, so I was more and more and more eager to 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 get involved here, but. Um, uh, you know, first off, this really hadn't been done. I mean, the term microgrid and something like this, what we're talking about is a utility scale microgrid are really, they're, they're different concepts. And so it, it may have been that he told me it's hard and we might not be able to do it. Uh, it was the reason I said, oh, yes, we can and sign me up. Uh, um, you know, I, I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough, our company is a privately held company. Uh, we're here in Houston. Uh, we're able to, to 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 look at this and say, "Hey, I think this is a good idea. We don't have to run a a model and send it up to you know some other state or something like that and and, and risk our quarterly bonus uh, because this does this is a slow moving deal and and, and it's complex. Um, um, and I think it's important that the the players involved here are are recognizable names there. They're, you know, they're, they're known entities. So, you know, uh, as a developer or, the, you know, the people who have established this mud, we know that we're dealing with groups that are uh, have the, the ability to, to see this through and to, to uh, deliver it. And, and, and if we're successful, like we said earlier, it, it, it's scalable. It can be replicated, whether it's center point. I think there were there's a lot of discussion about making these sort of standards so that it can be replicated and rolled out elsewhere. Um, uh, I I personally really do like working with others. I like collaborative efforts. This project we've also got uh, a, a joint venture, first of its kind, with flood control. Uh, it really it's just an example where everybody comes together and it can end up with a with a better product. And um, uh, so I, I, th I think the challenge that, that, that it's difficult and they, they need somebody to do this, our, uh, our development is just past phase one, which means that, that logistically we can sit down with, uh, with Centerpoint and they're gonna need a little bit of extra space. And uh, while, the, uh, while we're still on paper and making plans, we can accommodate the needs um, for for this, you know, whatever they whatever they need to put on the ground to to make this work, and uh, um, I I think it's just the right thing to do for 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 not just the residents but also Texas. Okay, I think you guys can see the questions in the chat. I've got three that are all asking basically the same thing. What about existing developments? Can you go back in and bury the lines that are existing in the air now uh, above ground, the ones that are above ground that are subject to fallen tree limbs? Can you go into an old development and, and bury those lines? Well, here's, Rick, here's kind of what we're working with with Centerpoint, okay? Centerpoint has to go where each, each uh, mud is what we call a use case, meaning none of them are alike, okay, in terms of how that they were built, when they were built, how it all kind of comes together. But um, as a general rule, what's going to be happening on each one that's, that they want to target, there's an upgrade that has to be done to the grid. OK, and um, and that's around these closing devices. And there's there's improvements that they have to do on the grid to make the microgrid. I do not think that it's going to make sense to be burying um, uh, the lines at a, a existing mud. There may be some situations where it makes sense, but you, there's also kind of some trade-offs around how much stuff costs. So they're going to look at them. There may be some that they bury, but as a general rule, when we're going in and doing a rehab, 
okay, of them. I think the expectation needs to be that they're going to harden the distribution system, okay? They're going to make it as good as they can make it, given the fact that it's above ground. And that's kind of the, the mindset that's going to be used on an existing mud. Now, on a new mud, okay, it's a different situation where we've got, it, there's more cost effect, there's different designs that they can use, there's different things that they can do to harden that distribution system better than we did 30 years ago, 20 years ago when we were putting these things in before, okay? So I think that uh, you're going to end up with a, um, uh, a situation in which they're going to design them the best that they can for resiliency, but the expectation, I don't think needs, I don't think realistically that they're going to be burying all the lines in these older neighborhoods. It's going to be a matter of being smart about what we do, getting them the best that we can, and um, and moving the ball forward along those lines. So this one says, I have heard about um, a pilot program that has already been implemented or is, is going on? What is the, the status on the pilot program we heard about? Okay, here's what you have. You kind of have, have two pieces of the puzzle um, under the pilot program is, is that we do have one pilot that's in flight right now, okay, that Centerpoint is actually paying for, okay? So it's a small pilot with 21 homes and, um, and that's been in flight and we're getting ready to finish up the further there's a lot of engineering that's gone into that okay a lot of the the proof of concept work has been done on that but it's very small okay that one is in flight right now and uh, we're anticipating going in and putting the physical components of that in probably sometime in the next 60 days okay then what you have is is that you've got the major pilots okay which is what we have put in front of the Public Utility Commission. And um, that is for the, you know, the whole neighborhoods, okay? The whole, you know, 2,000 homes, 1,500 homes, 7,000 homes, whatever that it is, whatever is in a mud, okay, is what we have proposed or what Centerpoint has proposed at the PUC, which is gonna be um, voted on sometime, I'm gonna say in the next 90 days. And the purpose of that is, is that, is to get a formal a formal um, uh, a formal pilot at the PUC level, but also so that Centerpoint can be assured that if they spend this money to do this for us, that they get paid back. Okay, and um, so that's the purpose of doing it through the PUC. Okay, and it's a formal process so that they can say, okay, is is that we're asking for thirty six million? Okay, to do these initial ones. All right, we want to do a lot of them, okay? They want to have the Houston area with lots of microgrids out there to help us through these tough times, all right? So think of these as the first um, the first ones through the pipe. And then once we get those done, then we'll be able to start scaling it out through the Houston area. Okay. I think it's fair to say that in a new development, we can really control the the environment and um, you know you're not trying to retrofit something um, and looking at these questions one thing that, that uh, uh, John explained to me is the complexity of being able to uh, uh, disconnect from the grid or put power back into the grid or, or not affect anything that's sort of downstream of you in the grid it is a is a complex engineering deal and and like anybody that's priced a generator you go wow that's not as bad as i thought it was and then they say yeah but the switch in the back that connects to your <laughs> your house is where it gets complicated right uh and that can be just as much as your house generator so it, it, it's the sort of interaction here that, that i think makes this complex and 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 uh, with a new development it's just easier to plan that out and control where your sources of power are coming in and, and exiting. Okay. Um, all three of you have mentioned Centerpoint. Why are they not here to discuss this critical service on this call? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I, I'll jump in there. And um, John, Harry, please add, add to. Look, I think there obviously is a, a formal proceeding ongoing um, at the at the commission, and Centerpoint likely sees 
that as kind of probably the most appropriate um, path or venue kind of to work through, um, you know, advocating for, for this program. You know, I'll, I'll also say that, you know, what Centerpoint um, proposed at the commission um, is it, it's pretty it's pretty broad from a program perspective, and there could be a lot of use cases that can fit into that program. And so we specifically wanted to to highlight this use case, um, an extremely high value use case that is the the mud and coupling it with the water supply, because uh, we see that as um, a strong player um, in in this program. Yeah, they've, uh, Rick, they've generally been in on all the webinars that we've done because they want to educate and they want to help people understand what it is that they're trying to do to improve the resiliency of the system. But we didn't want to, while while that um, resiliency filing is is formally being reviewed, it, um, it puts them in an awkward position to be out there telling people, you know, promoting what they're, what they've requested at the same time. So we they felt and we felt it made better sense for the, us to do this without them. And then as soon as we do get it, um, uh, as soon as soon as we get some clarity on it, then they want to be front and center uh, because they are the critical element, guys. Is is that we can come up with all the great ideas in the world, we can bring all the great ideas and technology, but without those guys and their help, it doesn't go anywhere. And they've been critical. When you saw when you see those laws that got passed. That wasn't just me, okay. That did that is is that that was center point and and it, a lot of a lot of heavy lifting was done by a lot of people that want to see a solution out there. So um, so anyway, they're right there with us. They want it to happen. They know that they need it to happen, as witnessed by the last couple of weeks. So you'll be seeing them waving the flag here as soon as we get to, uh, as soon as we get the green lights on the pilot. I think that you'll you'll you everybody they want everybody to know because they've been getting beat up and um, and they want people to know that they're trying to be proactive and it just takes time. And so that's kind of where we are right now. Gotcha. So depending on the number of homes in a subdivision, will there be a need for more than one generator? You're, yes. Okay, so here's what happens. Every subdivision is gonna be different, okay? Is, is that you've got some of them we've seen with 200 homes, 300 homes. Others with like Harry's, I think at the end of the day, he's going to have like 7,000 homes in his. So what you're doing is you're sizing the number of generators for how much load that you have inside the mud. So the guarantee is you'll have a lot more than one generator. Okay. It just depends on how big the mud is as to how many generators that you're going to need because you've got to carry all the load that's inside it. John, I would also say, I mean, that adds a layer, that redundancy too, right? There's, it adds a layer of reliability and resiliency um, as well, having multiple assets, multiple generators at a, at a given location. Yeah. So think about this, Rick, is, is that we're talking about reliability, okay? And reliability, and you got to think about it a little differently you don't want to just have one big asset that has one point of failure that if it breaks, you're done. Okay. So when you start talking about reliability, you want multiple assets providing the solution so that it's because it is, they're pieces of equipment. Okay. They're natural gas and they're very reliable, but it's, it's like a car or anything else. I mean, you're, you, nothing is, and they're mechanical pieces of equipment. So the more points of failure that you can build into the way you design things, the more effective you're going to be at keeping the lights on. All right, we got four more minutes and I'm getting a ton of questions. I've got a couple here associated that are all about the cost. How much is it going to cost to the customers? How much is it going to cost to the mud? Now, I think you mentioned mud, there's no direct cost and you're going to transfer that cost to the customers. But how much is this all going to cost? Yeah, well, here's what you have is, is that the grid upgrades, okay, are being put into the rate base, right? So I don't, we don't know exactly what the increases in the cost. I've heard numbers from two to three dollars a month type of things out of the center. And maybe Thomas can mention, can, can clarify that. 
but it's it's going to be a, an X number of dollars per month in everybody's um, bills. Okay, across the um, across the system for, for resiliency. That's not just these um, generators. Okay, that's all the improvements that they have proposed. Okay, so you're going to have an uplift in your bills to make the system more resilient, of which microgrids are just a piece of it. Okay. Then the big expensive thing with regards to these microgrids is the generators, okay? And um, because that's where your big money is spent. That's going to be, um, on, the generators themselves are actually going to be owned by investors, okay? Outside money is going to invest in the generators because that's where there is a return, okay? They're getting, they're getting paid for running those generators two to 300 hours a year, Okay, and the economics work. So what's really happening is, is that the rate payer is paying for the upgrades in the grid to enable this and investors are paying for the generators that make it all work. Yeah, John, and, and just to, to add to that, maybe clarify one thing. So what, and this is a, a good example of what Centerpoint is currently asking for cost recovery as it relates to the pilot. So they're asking for cost recovery for kind of those distribution level upgrades. And those those costs are going to be spread across all of Centerpoint's customers. So just wanted to clar clarify that because, you know, there are benefits from deploying these assets when they're not being used. And well, frankly, when they're being used too for emergency operations for the mud, but there's benefits for the entire, the entire um, grid, the entire um, transmission and distribution system that Centerpoint has. And so those costs will be spread out across all, all customers. All right, one last one, because we want to be respectful of everybody's time and it's almost one. Will microgrid generators run on diesel or natural gas? And will that present a problem in 20 years when the government wants the country to move to renewable energy? Okay, the, um, okay so here's kind of where this is. Right now, we believe we are uh, looking to use natural gas for all of these microgrids. Okay, now that doesn't mean to say that there isn't some situation which demands diesel. OK, out there, we have to be open for that. But the the way that these are designed is that if technology changes, OK, which it will. All right. Is is that it's designed to be able to take the old technology out and put new technology in. So let's say hydrogen does something or something, you know, they come up with some who knows what is is that it's designed to be able to. These, these assets are designed to solve the problem today, okay? And they're the only things that can solve our problem today. And then if it becomes where they have another, another technology that can solve the problem, then we can, it can be swapped out. It can be set up. I mean, it's, it's designed to be able to take in new technologies. So you actually can still plug in solar, you can still do batteries. If a mud wants to do some, look at some of those different things. None of those things need, should be off the table. We don't want to build something out there that can evolve as the conversation evolves. Well, okay. well said, John. I'll, I'll just say this is the platform, right, to for whatever energy transition or evolution occurs. I think this is the platform, the foundation that you start with. All right. Got to run, guys. I know we're out of time. Town, Rick. So, yeah. if if people the extra questions and whatnot is is that uh, uh, you know we'll we'll figure out a way to reach back to people to get them all answered, okay? Um, because it is starting the conversations accelerating, and I appreciate everyone's interest in learning about this. Yeah, definitely. That's why we put these on. John's email is still up on the screen. I had a lot of questions, guys. I tried to get to all of them, couldn't get to all of them. But if you have questions, ask John. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Personally, I want to thank John, Harry, and Thomas for speaking to our group. Uh, great information, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Dennis, again for helping us out. Real quick, our next August webinar 
Parks webinar is August 9th. Uh, it'll feature Brett Bergen with Tex Terry's Landscape and Design, talking about green spaces, clean spaces, a guide to park maintenance. So thank my presenters again. Y'all did a fabulous job. We appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank Ricky. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Sorry. Okay, Taylor. 102. Are y'all still there, John? I am. I am. Okay, we had to run to it. We got to get another webinar started, so we're on the same program okay. or something. So go ahead and go do your thing. I'll reach, Rick, I'll reach back to you. Okay. En enjoy your time in Capri, my friend. Thank you.